Good morning. Here is hoping you can hear me. And here is also hoping that the network is at least up to par this morning. I would appreciate your feedback. Yeah, I know the video is gone. I have two separate systems, but one went off. But I've switched off to the other one now. And I'm hoping that we would have a stress-free broadcast session this morning. So can you see me and can you hear me good now? Okay. Thank you, Uche Omo. You say you can hear me loud and clear and I'm good to go. Okay, so um, I'm deliberately starting early so that if there is any problem, I'll be able to at least do some troubleshooting. But as you might well have noticed, I've apparently drawn the attention of some rather angry people in recent days. The last two broadcasts have attracted hackers. First, it was the system itself that was hacked, and thereafter, my microphones were also attacked. That happened last week. So it might very well be that I'll start making these a pre-recorded program so that we can avoid this problem with hacking. So um, like once again, good morning. I'm going to start with the questions I received on the email address that you will see running at the bottom of your screen. If you have questions, feel free to be sending them in Delifaro to me 6 at gmail.com. But I got a few questions that came in during the course of the week. I'll treat them one after the other. The first is from a gentleman called Ugochuku Adoma. He says, I heard your total condemnation of an alliance with Air Rufai, and my questions are those. Should we not at a point where we uh, should we not be at a point where we consider any possibility that affords us a place in Aso Rock? That was his first question. I'll deal with that straight up. I don't believe that you can find any good in evil. And if there is any Nigerian politician that is thoroughly evil, despicable, and not to be accommodated. It is Air Rufai. Air Rufai is not someone you want to find any deal with simply because you're looking for power. I have no accommodation for evil. I'm human. I sin. I do a lot of things that I'm not proud of, but I will not consciously walk in and embrace evil. And that is what I believe Air Rufai to be. So to answer your question, nothing is worthy of an embrace of Air Rufai. Nothing, absolutely nothing is worthy of that embrace. The second part of your question is, what if Nigerians fail to unite by 2027? What options are available to us? I think majority of Nigerian youth have not witnessed what good governance is, and so they are not ready to pay the price to get it. Look, 50 years in the life of a country is a day. It is very possible that by 2027, the Nigerian youth would fail to grab the network again that would also be because we have failed to adequately communicate the urgency of the moment and the importance of finding the common ground required to liberate ourselves. But none of that, none of that should elicit despair in us. I picked today's topic deliberately and when we come to that, we'll deal with it. It is very possible that we might still fail to unite in 2027. But remember that we did not lose in 2023 because we failed to find common purpose or to unite. We lost because the system won. The system won by subverting our will. Einek did the biddings of his masters. The judiciary also could not rise above his own putrefaction and corruption. So it wasn't that we lost because we failed. We didn't lose because we failed. We lost because the system won evil one well i'll deal with that again when we come to the substance of this morning's lecture if i argue says firstly how would you or we your fans be able to relay your preaching or content of your weekly lectures to the core that is the grassroots who are not literate enough to assimilate your lectures and sensitization 
Secondly, do you think obedience to form obedient party of Nigeria and have obedience run on the platform in 2027? Does Obi stand a good chance in 2027? There are two questions there. I'll deal with the first one. When I speak with you, my assumption is that those I cannot reach can be reached by you. I can't speak with your driver. I might not be able to speak with your husband or your wives or your children or your mothers or your fathers or your co-workers, your colleagues, your friends, but you can speak with them. So for me, it's not about my person, it's about the ideas that I propagate. If those ideas resonate in your spirit, you have the duty to take those ideas to those you can reach. I may speak English and they might not. It might be that they speak Anago, they might speak Yoruba, they might speak Awusa, Fufude, Igbo language, Ijo, Kalabari, Efik, whatever language you speak, when you hear me, translate the ideas you have received, translate it to those who cannot hear what I have to say or who might hear me and not understand. To now speak to the second leg of your question, this is not about the person of Peter Gregory Obi. This is about ideas. The person who will support in 2027 might very well not be Peter Obi because a Peter Obi that is romancing a Anel Rufai cannot find my support. Let's be clear about that. There are certain lines that you draw. It is about ideas. So when we come to that bridge in 2027, if we get to that bridge, don't look at the persons. Look to the ideas that they espouse. Are they promising a new Nigeria, a different way of doing things? Are they promising you citizenship? Are they dealing with the substance of your pains? Do they bear promise that suggests that we might have a turnaround in our country? That is what 2027 is about. It's not, I agree that our current political parties are next to useless. They are almost one and the same, almost without exception, if the truth be told. So I'm not really speaking to anything beyond ideas. And those ideas, if they coalesce and find resonance in your spirit, what happens thereafter is that ideas will bind all of us together. Those ideas are what bound the obedient movement. The obedient movement was in existence long before there was a Peter OB presidential bid. The obedient movement, was, but what you call the obedient movement today, encompasses a whole lot of people who are in the NSAS movement, a whole lot of people who are in, say, like, enough is enough, a whole lot of people who, everybody who desired change in Nigeria became part and parcel of the obedient movement. And that had nothing to do with the person of Peter Obi. It was the promise, the promise of change that he embodies that was what we all coalesced around. It's not about a party. That's why someone like me was very careful to explain from the beginning that I am not a member of the Labour Party. I spoke for Peter Obi. I supported Peter Obi. I still support him today because of the ideals that he represents. He's not an angel. None of us are. I'm no angel. So if I'm not an angel, how can I possibly be looking for an angel? It is about ideas. Those ideas and the ideals are the things for which we speak, and those are the things that drew us to Peter Gregory OB. So if in 2027 he remains consistent and he has not changed from the person we have known him to be since he came into the public consciousness, of course, by all means, we will lift our support for him to another level, and a whole lot of people have to be singing in concert from the same in book if we are going to make a dent in the system come 2027. The last question came from a gentleman named Omoni. Omoni or Motola, maybe that's a guy or a woman, I'm not sure now. It's a unisex name. Both names are actually unisex. But the question is, can we ramp up a very strong movement against the 2027 elections for a full restructuring of our entire system of governance? Also, can you speak to the Orange Union as proposed by Daily Ogun and how it can materialize? Let me deal with the first part, and I've touched on it in answering Ifani's question. Movements are about common ideas. To restructure Nigeria is a highly desirable idea. And it's always been the lodestone of my own arguments 
in the Nigerian political space. But I have noticed that we've come to a point where we would have to make those ideas political, which means that somebody must stand behind those ideas and make those ideas the central plank of political engagement. In a, in a situation where, one, the NLC is lost, organized labor is completely compromised as at today, the civil society organizations, they've been lost long before the emergence of Jaguda. But certainly since around 2011 and their misadventure at Ojota, when they found common purpose with the AC, that's the Action Congress of Tinubu, who was more or less the sole bankroller of the civil rights movement in Nigeria when he was still forming opposition to the PDP. Since that time, what you find is that there has been a fragmentation of Nigerian opposition movement and it's been almost impossible to find common purpose. So I'm not too sure if it is possible to galvanize sufficient support for a boycott of the 2027 elections whilst we are demanding for a restructuring of Nigeria. But be sure of one thing, I support the idea, but at the end of the day, I'm a realist. I guess age and time forces a lot of realism on us. My next birthday, I'm going to be 56. I'm not too sure if it is possible to actually get common ground, sufficient common ground to be able to galvanize that movement. But I think it is very possible to galvanize the people behind a political movement that demands the restructuring of Nigeria and then place that front and center as part of the, as, as part of the basis of engagement with the electorate going towards 2027. It's a brilliant question, fair one as well, but that is the way I see it for now. Now to speak to Mr. Deli Ogun's Orange Union proposal, it is, aligned again to the restructuring argument. The Orange Union proposal is another form of restructuring argument, and I think the first leg of my answer also deals with that. I happen to believe that this proposal is by far more radical than the one being proposed by people like myself. And when you find that people like myself are not even listened to within the context of the Nigerian restructuring argument, you find that it becomes even more of a yeoman's job to have an agreement that allows for anything remotely close to what Egmo Deli Ogun is suggesting. But let me go on record as saying that I have no argument against what he's saying, and I believe that he's, a, he's worthy of serious consideration by Nigerians. But how many Nigerians have come into contact with those proposals or understand them? Those are the questions that came in um good morning once again if you're just joining us i've dealt with the questions that came in in the course of the week now i want us to talk to today's topic retaining hope in a hopeless place usually when i'm speaking with you i almost always speak from subjects that I had spent time to think about, probably even write about in one of my books or an article at some point or the other. But today, I am speaking to a subject that began to bug my brain in recent time, and that is the silly futility of demanding change in a place that appears to be deliberate about looking for destruction. Nigeria appears to be logged into a self-destructive trajectory, and it appears to be in love with this trajectory almost to the point of not being interested in changing anything. So the more you try to hope and be hopeful about something good happening, the more everything seems to become worse in this country called Nigeria. Fela was, uh, he's on record, he says, 
how this country can't get a big year. You know, at the height of Fela's desperation and disappointment with Nigeria, he just couldn't fathom how it seems that the harder he tried to make people see things, the more difficult and disappointing everything appears to be. But you know me, I'm a man who is generally in love with my definitions because I want you to understand the context of my discussion so that you are better able to either agree with me or even if you are going to disagree, have some substance to your disagreement. When I say retaining hope in a hopeless place, what do I mean? The place you already know is Nigeria. Nigeria is the place I'm referring to as being hopeless. But what is hope? Hope is defined as a feeling of expectation and desire for a particular thing to happen. So if I'm desiring something to happen, if I have expectations of something happening, you will know that what I'm desiring is a better Nigeria, a country that works for all of us, a place where we are citizens and not treated as serfs, a place where the law rules and not the will of men. That is the hope. The hope that you wake up in a country, this country is blessed in every ramification except that it is caused by bad leadership. In fact, zero leadership. It is caused with evil leaders. So you wake up in the morning, you go to sleep hoping that something will change. But some of us have gone beyond hoping. We actually try to do something to affect the situation. Some people have died working to change the situation they, they they retained hope in their spirit but nigeria dashed the hope you see the thing about hope is that it is almost always futuristic you look to the future with hope you are expecting that the current realities would change and you retain some hope in your spirit that that thing would change hope demands that we must wait so you know that what you are hoping for might take time, but you take incremental steps in the direction of hope. You wait. You, you, you wait for that thing to change. It demands, it demands, it demands per perseverance. So we, we, we wait in hope in spite of everything. That is why some of us have refused to run away in spite of the seeming hopelessness of the Nigerian reality. Hope is also found on faith because most of the time there is nothing of substance to touch when you are looking to Nigeria. There is nothing, of, nothing about Nigeria suggests that you should have any hope in the country. But we continue to hope and it is a function of faith. The Bible defines faith, I think, succinctly when it says that it is a substance of things not seen, the evidence of things hoped for. You hope in faith that things would change. And if you must have faith, there is almost always a linkage to the, a belief in God. Do not confuse this with religion. I am not a religious person, but I do believe in the existence of God. I know those of you, my atheist friend, who are very, very intelligent, have rationalized that there is no God, and I'm not having a religious discussion with you. I am simply saying that there is an alignment between faith and godliness. And then if you have hope, you almost always believe in the existence of God. Now, when you now look at all of these and then you ask yourself, what then is hopelessness? It is having no expectation of good or success. And that is what Nigeria demands of us. It says that we shouldn't hope. Chief Bola Ige, more than any other person, even defines it succinctly. He says, blessed are those who do not hope, for they shall not be disappointed. That was what Chibola they said about hope. But hope we must because it is the basis for human existence at any appreciable or intellectual level. Without hope, we're lost. Nigeria says we shouldn't hope. And there are so many evidences and basis for, being dis for despairing and having no hope in Nigeria. Look, INEC promised us hope. The legislators passed the Electoral Act, Amendment Act of, I think, 2022. And it says, it promised us, you see, that's the promise, hope and promise. They work hand in hand. It, they promised, they said, oh, 
electoral results will be transmitted from the polling unit level. And this hope was backed up by a promise made by the fraudulent Yakubu. He promised us, he rekindled our hope. And we started hoping against hope that he will keep his promise. You remember what happened when he broke his promise? Right when everybody was sleeping, Yakubu came out and said, Go to court. The most brazen declaration of hopelessness ever heard from the mouth of a public servant or a person who should be a public servant but is essentially an evil servant. He said, Go to court. Saint Augustine said something. I quoted him seven years ago to the day. He said, in the absence of justice, what is sovereignty but organized robbery? Nigeria has become essentially a place that is organized for robbery. So it's a crime scene. Let me repeat that quote. In the absence of justice, Sovereignty becomes nothing short of organized crime. I'm paraphrasing him. That quote is about a thousand years old. It came to Nigeria to find resonance. The judiciary, which should be the last hope of the common man, hope again, see? The judiciary should be the last hope of the common man but when Einek and Yakubu were done dashing the hope they are giving us of, a, of an electoral process in which we might hope, turned around and he said to us, go to court. He was saying go to court because he was comfortable in the knowledge that the judiciary is hopeless. That was why he could say what he said. And the hopelessness of the judiciary came to the fore. We began to get technical justice before the PEPT. Completely technical. The hopeless Supreme Court reinforced the hopelessness of the PEPT. That's the Presidential Electoral Election Petition Tribunal. The Supreme Court reinforced it. It became even more hopeless than the hopeless PEPT. The last hope of the common man proved itself to be completely hopeless. That is the Nigerian judiciary. Now, the final nail in the coffin of that hope was the inability of the most of what i had once believed to be the most conscious layer of the nigerian revolutionary movement to find common purpose with the expression of the public will in a place like nigeria where regain has become the order of the day it was very possible for INEC, in spite of everything to still credit the winner of the election with over 6 million votes without showing the workings. But those who should know better were probably the first to start rejoicing that the person they consider their enemy lost the election instead of looking to the person who won, quote and unquote, the election. We all lost eventually simply because they couldn't see the larger picture. The hopeless usurper and his destructive predecessor notwithstanding, what do we have today? A man gains power fraudulently. That was bad enough in the first sense that he extinguished hope. He made people lose hope in the system. A lot of people left Nigeria after the 2023 election, I know a few because they couldn't find any peaceful way out of the cold de sac into which we've been locked. 
they realized that it didn't matter any longer what the will of the people might be. And they left. They voted with their feet. Largely members of the Nigerian middle class, they sold their substance in Nigeria, relocated to everywhere, Australia, New Zealand, Canada. They left. They left because the situation had become so hopeless. The person who gained power through the destruction of our hope has done nothing to restore hope or to even give the illusion of hope. If anything, he has reinforced just how hopeless the situation has become. The first word that came out of his mouth at his inauguration, subsidy is gone. We know today that the subsidy that he says is gone is still being paid under the table without any hint of probity. We also know that our judiciary is not only useless, but it is accompanied by a most useless legislature who does not even understand his oversight functions or his job as the post keeper of the commonwealth. It is more interested in having prayers sent to his inboxes. So Jaguda came into power and what has happened? Breezing, unbridled, stealing. Better I do. Fisayo Shoyombo has done a fantastic job of exposing the rot in our custom. Not a whimper, not a single word has come out of the Nigerian police, except for the police to start chasing after Fisayo himself. And then the EFCC found nothing better to do with his time than to be chasing a cross-dresser around, and then he took that cross-dresser to court for mutilating the Naira because he sprayed Naira, or shame sprayed Naira. And what happened? The victims are busy rejoicing that the person whose sexual proclivities might be different from their own has been caged for spending or abusing Naira. The people who are stealing the Naira are not abusing the Naira, but it is the idiot who spread the Naira. The same thing that almost everybody who has attended an Owambe party in Nigeria has done. That is the reason for sending shame to prison. And the victims are busy rejoicing because of the victimization of another victim. That is the extent of hopelessness that has come into our space. In the same country where the National Security Advisor is still ensconced in his office in spite of the fact that somebody who was in detention in his facility not only left detention, got into a private jet and actually flew out of the country. In this country, and we are busy, very busy, applauding the imprisonment of Bobby Risky. That is the extent of the hopelessness of our situation. Somebody who calls himself the Minister of Works actually found the grace to stand in the public space to be justifying how they can be spending three billion for every kilometer of road. Are they paving it with gold? There is, an inter, there is an intercontinental, is it a continental highway being constructed from Cairo to Cape Town that is only marginally more expensive than the road we are building to Calabar. The same country that, had no, that has no money to fund education, has no money to fund health care, is spending three billion per kilometer. A whole lot of people are going to end up having their livelihood destroyed because of the greed and avarice of the commander-in-chief. One man, Peter Gregory Obi, he spent his money and he's drilling boreholes at his own expense, with his own money. But the only thing that has exercised those who should be worried about the direction of our country is the quality of what he has built. Meanwhile, your legislators 
voted 198 million for each borehole that they are planning to drill. Waterworks no longer exist in Nigeria. The government is fixing money for boreholes. And it is 193 or is it 198 million for one borehole. And we cannot even see the ludicrousness of focusing on the person, whether you like what he is doing or not. Why not focus on those who have the money, who have voted money, who mongol storms to build boroughs that me and you know they are not even going to build. But you have time to be focusing on the private individual. Private individual, whether he's doing it for political reasons or not, he's immaterial, he is doing it. That should be sufficient basis for you to begin to question why the public pulse is not sufficient to do something about the paucity and shortage of water across the length and breadth of our country. I live in Lagos. There is no, not even one square inch of public water works in the entire Lekki metropolis. This does not bother you. It does not engage your attention. It, does, it is not deserving of criticism. But the man who is spending his own money to build a borehole is the reason why I don't to 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 up and down the place. How hopeless can a situation get? There is no way one looks to all these and then retain hope in this place because it just does not appear as if people who should care even truly care about the situation they are confronted with. Propaganda has replaced governance. There is no purpose to governance beyond stealing. Corruption has become brazen amidst the worsening economic conditions of the country. And yet, one is supposed to retain hope in this hopeless place. Terrorism has become normal. The Minister of Defense was said to be the one taking, taking food to terrorists. And this is not engaging the attention of those who should be in the forefront of holding government to account. It is Peter Obi Boho that is engaging their attention. Impunity has been licensed to the point where people are brazenly in daylight mining mineral resources up and down the length of Nigeria. And what happened in Okwama? It's very simple. The government licensed impunity to the point where Tom Polo and his people are in open rebellion against the sovereignty of the state or licensing the state to fight its private wars. And then Okwama happened. And in a democracy, pressmen are excluded from the panel of inquiry. They cannot even report on it. And this is a democracy. What has happened to conventional resistance? What has become of the voices that used to speak truth to power in our space? The opposition movement has become so completely divided that it cannot even find common ground in spite of the fact that we are facing common threats. Bigotry has become so ingrained that victims cannot even recognize the commonalities of the afflictions of the persons that they are deriding. That a person is Yoruba is enough reason for you to hate him. That a person is Igbo is enough reason for you to hate him. That somebody is even saying something different from what you want to hear is enough reason for you to label the person in order to remove his humanity. My father is an, was an Ijesha man from Imersini. So was his mother and his father, both from the same Imersini in Osho State. My mother is from Fiditi in Oyo State. So was her father and her mother, Olukole, from Ile Olukole in Fiditi. I went to Fiditi Grammar School, and yet some morons will turn around in order to delegitimize what I am saying. Say, oh, his mother was his mother is Igbo. So what if my mother is Igbo? But she's not. 
but it is convenient for you to delegitimize my voice by labeling me. That is the extent of the dumbness that has assailed us and is afflicting us today in Nigeria. It is enough to label a man in order to silence his voice. What has become of us? How easy it is to despair when one looks at the madness that has overtaken our land. Bigotry has rendered us impossible has rendered us incapable of seeing what we should see. All you need to do to silence a man is to give him a label. The content of his character does not matter any longer. What happened to common purpose? But in the midst of all of these, remember what I said. Retaining hope in a hopeless place we must retain hope because without hope everything is lost we might as well be dead if we can no longer hold on to hope yorubas have a proverb and i'll share it with you it says enitie gonle koku iroju tori bo se nre ara aye those pursued by the ancestral mask, the masquerade, should keep hope. Because as the ancestral, as the human being running from the mask tires, so does the man who is ensconced in the ancestral mask. One thing I need us all to understand is this. There is one thing over which none of us have any control. And that is the passage of time. When I see Obasanjo living with his regrets today, I laugh because his is a story that should resonate in the spirit of all who have any brain left in their heads. Time will come and it will pass. Jaguda's time will pass. Buhari's time came and it passed. We survived him. Nigeria survived him. Jaguda's time will pass. And when that time has passed, what would remain are chronicles of what we did during those seasons. It is not done, and I've not found it anywhere in history, that evil won. Evil never went. Maybe for a season it might appear to succeed, but eventually evil will lose. This season will pass. Those who sold their soul and found the peace of the graveyard and kept quiet while Nigeria is destroyed, history will remember all of you. The words we speak today will live beyond our season. Retain your hope because when all of this is gone, hope will remain. It is all we have. It is what makes us human. The ability to look to tomorrow with expectation of something better. It is all we have. And we will keep the hope. We know. We know as a fact that Jaguda's time will come and go. The Akpabios of this world will come and go. The CJN, it will come and go. All of them, they will go. They will pass into nothing with time. We're still flesh, mortal flesh, walking around, but our day will come and we will go. It builds nothing. The drunk forgets his poverty, but with sobriety, we return the consciousness of his poverty. This season we pass. And the truth will always triumph. I need you to understand that. Keep up the hope. Don't let yourself despair. Retain hope. It is the one potent weapon you have in the face of the adversity that Nigeria has become. Retain your hope. Keep your good cheer. It will pass. Every lie eventually dies. It is normal. Eventually, every lie will die. It will perish. This is not going to be an exception. Hmm. 
You know, Yorubas have this proverb. I'll use that to close my sermon for the day. They say, Be rubber lolo gordon. He said, You can lo to aba. If the light travels for 20 years, it takes the truth but a minute to catch up with it. I've sought to explain this to you in the past. When you interpret like that, you lose the essence of what the Yorubas are saying. They are not suggesting that the truth chases after the lie. Nah. The truth remains fixed, immutable, solid, fixed as a northern star. It is the lie that travels. It travels and it might go for years, but because the truth is the truth, it stays in the same place. When the lie with all its peregrination is tired, it comes back to where the truth is staying. That is what they are saying in their proverb. Keep your hope. In spite of the seeming hopelessness of the situation, retain your hope. We survived Abacha. We're here today. We celebrated when Abacha died. We thought we had seen the worst. We survived Buari. We will survive Tinumbu and his cronies. But it is critical that you retain your hope. Do not despair. It is in despairing that the enemy wins. Because when you despair, you give up hope. And in hopelessness, evil becomes normalized. The audacity of your hope is what brings out the demons in them. Keep your hope. In spite of everything, retain your hope. I will definitely see you next week by the special grace of the Almighty. In the interim, do not forget. If you have questions, send them in. The email address is running in the ticker at the bottom of the screen. Send to delifaru to me 6 at gmail.com. I'm going to see you next week. God bless you all. But keep your hope. Keep your hope. Retain your hope. Do not despair. God bless you all. Amen. Enjoy the rest of your week.